So uh, I'll be discussing on uh, a broad headings, CNS TV, Lymph Node TV, Plural Pericardial TV. As uh, as you know, so each of the each of the topic uh, it can it can be dedicated one hour for each of the topics. So it will be just uh, an overview, and I will highlight important points and important updates of this. So there is uh, only a single uh, extra pulmonary TB guidelines all over the world. That is the uh, index TB guidelines. It was published in 2016, and it was uh, published on uh, the All India Institute of New Delhi in collaboration with WHO. And uh, we are still awaiting an update to this document. So uh, if, we, if you see this document, uh, in most of the cases, you will find that the guidelines are very sketchy. So the uh, reason being, there is a very, very big lack of evidence in extra pulmonary tuberculosis. If not, not even in India, not even from develop, under, uh, developing countries, it is from the, also from the developed world. So uh, to formulate a guideline, we need to have a great and good amount of uh, review, preparation, like systematic reviews, meta-analysis, which is very lacking in this field. So uh, the first topic is uh, serious tuberculosis, that is, uh, you know, that, uh, Tubercular meningitis, tubercular serendipitis, cerebral abscess, and uh, tubercular radicular myelitis. So my focus would be uh, in the salient points on diagnosis and management. So um, in CNS TB, so if it is tubercular meningitis, we know <coughs> that uh, any tubercular process it is an, a subacute chronic process. But often times we see patients presenting in the emergency with alter sensory young fever with a short history, three to four days, and you are finding that gene expert is coming to be positive. So not in all cases, in, in, in acute cases like acute management cellulitis, you will have to have the suspicion of tuberculosis. In most of the cases we find that the focus is lung, and it, it, is, a, it is a secondary uh, 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 dissemination to the CNS which has led to tubercular meningitis. So we have to be very watchful that even in acute conditions you should suspect TB in countries like India. So other features like alter sensorium, fever, vomiting, meningeal signs, where signs of increased ICP will be So uh, I am just uh, in CNS tuberculosis, radiology is very, uh, it plays a very important role, firstly in diagnosis. So uh, any imaging, you should have, it should be a, a contrast enhanced imaging. As you have to look for basal uh, exudates and you have to look for miniature enhancements, without contrast studies, you, are, you will not be able to find out these things. So this is a typical <coughs> brain imaging, contrast imaging of tubercular meningitis. It is showing basal exudates. Along with brain, in case of TB uh, meningitis, you have to have a, a screening MRI for spine. I will come to that why, why you should have. And uh, apart from CT, uh, uh, apart from the diagnostic purpose, you have to have a, 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 a brain imaging in hand to decide for the lumbar puncture. As in case of uh, obstructive hydrocapillus, high ICP, you have to postpone it. You have to postpone your lumbar puncture in case of high intercranial pressure and you have to move other indication for peritoneal shunting like AP shunt or uh, your ventriculostomy. So radiology plays a very important role whenever you are suspecting CNS tuberculosis. <coughs> so next coming to CSF analysis. When you are sick, you can you see that you are able to perform a CSF lumbar function. So in, uh, it is, in most of the cases, it is uh, lymphocytic predominance in CSF. But, but in, in many cases, it has been seen that in early CNS meningitis by TB, early CNS tubercular meningitis, it is the neutrophilic predominance. So that neutrophilic predominance often lead us, mislead us to rule out tuberculosis. But in, 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 in most of the early cases of tubercular meningitis, it is neutrophilic predominance in CSF. In uh, biochemistry, it is high, you know, it is high, high protein often in present very, very high protein in CSF and with uh, normal to low sugar. Now, it is the adenosine DMIS. In, uh, in my uh, 
subsequent slides I will also show that this adenosine of demand T minus levels it has got a significant value in identifying and in suspecting tuberculosis in the extrapulmonary region. In CSF, it is from a very big meta analysis. We can say we can say that if you take the cutoff of nine or ten, it has a very good sensitivity. I am comparing the sensitivity with, of course, with TB culture. Uh, that is a gold standard. So the sensitivity comes to 79% with a high specificity of 91%. So whenever there is a diagnostic dilemma, so you have to have you have to get an additional clue from the CSF ADL. So next is the uh, microbiological tests. So in any case of tuberculosis, be it pulmonary and be it extra pulmonary, it is, it is a routine and it is in the guideline now, you have to have a microbiological diagnosis. This is for mainly for two reasons. One, it, it confirms your diagnosis, it establishes your diagnosis. And secondly, you have to obtain some information regarding drug resistance. So uh, in the microbiological um, tests, Zenin staining and apart from culture, gene expert is widely available, but it gives you the resistance pattern for rifampicin only. So it is advisable for all samples to be tested for TB. You have to, you have to request for a culture, preferably a liquid culture by the MGIP system, that is the mycobacteria growth independent TB. This is a Backtech system, just like blood culture, Backtech. They have 96 small tubes which, as we are, uh, which provides a very good growth condition for microbacterial tuberculosis and for other atypical microbacteria also. So it is a very confirmatory test and compared to conventional LJ media culture, it gives a better, much better culture positivity rate. So whenever you are able to grow the bacteria, culture, so it, it becomes easy to identify the drug resistant pattern, either by conventional drug susceptibility tests, but in the national guidelines in India and worldwide, it is, uh, it is almost the same that uh, everyone is suggesting to go for blind probes. It is a very simple test and can be uh, done as a point of care test also. So depending on the bands formed for each drug, you can say that uh, for Eismenzide, Rifampicin, Rifampicin, Pyrazinamide, for first line and for the second line if you are also available. So you can test for each and every drug you are giving to your patients. So if it is gene expert positive and Rifampicin sensitive, you do not know the, the uh, sensitivity pattern of other three drugs you are using. So it is always advisable to, uh, to make, make, make your efforts to the fullest to grow the bacteria in culture that you can get a full uh, spectrum of the sensitivity pattern of the strain. So uh, in the treatment, so it is uh, the conventional regimen plus dexamethasone. So there are multiple school of thoughts. So uh, people have come up with ideas and it is still uh, to be established, still to be uh, circulated in guidelines, but it, it is well established that in case of CNSTB, uh, if you don't, you can avoid it. For low CSF concentration, see in early CNS uh, tuberculosis, CNS uh, TB meningitis, there is uh, disruption of blood vessels here, so any drug can be injured, even streptomycin will be injured. So, if you don't, will also be injured. But considering a long course of the treatment, when there is uh, uh, the damage has been taken care of and blood vessel is intact, if you don't, will uh, not reach uh, uh, CNS to have a good penetration. So, and also the ocular toxicity and uh, in case of CNS, CNS tuberculosis, you know there is cranial nerve involvement. So, you, you uh, really try to avoid another drug which can cause ocular toxicity. So, uh, the uh, eligible alternatives to Hambiotol are Nezoline and Nidoproxis. And in most of the good centers in India and in all over the world, uh, people are not using, it is an expert opinion that you, have, you can omit Ithambiotol and you can add uh, liver processing or linezolin to the HRZ regime. So uh, what are the complications? The complications are like vasculitic stroke. So in many cases of uh, 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 tuberculosis, you see there are 
discrete behavior is still so happening. So uh, is there any uh, point to treat that discrete stroke? Yes. There are very good amount of data that is saying that either low dose or high dose aspirin you can give uh, to prevent the progression of this ischemic stroke that is a vascular stroke in case of tuberculosis meningitis. The second and the most dreaded thing is the hydrocephalus. In the very high number of cases in CMST, we see there is high obstructive hydrocephalus. So the key to, key to management is the early identification by imaging and uh, sending the patient to the specialist, neurosurgeon, for uh, neurosurgeons for either detection or endoscopic part of the endoscopy. And next is vision loss. Though very rarely reported, but it has a very high incidence. The uh, high, uh, high output, how uh, high admission centers have reported a very incidence of optochiasmatic aramonidiasis in cases of tuberculosis meningitis. So it, uh, I'm coming here. And uh, a rare complication that is transverse myelitis. Uh, it, it has been written in, in traditional literature as a rare complication. But in a recent study, it has been found that these complications are really not very rare. They are rarely detected or diagnosed. So what is optochiasmatic aramonidiasis? That you are treating a patient with CNS tuberculosis, uh, tubercular meningitis, and patient is complaining of bilateral uh, vision loss, which is uh, subacute in onset. So in this case, vision loss is almost found in 14 to 35 percent of cases. So you have to suspect, and you have to go for a contrast MRI to find the. Uh, you will see in the radiology that the optic chiasma there is exudates and enhancements. So uh, the treatment is early detection and pulse steroids. Many people have tried thalidomide, even I have my experience with thalidomide, it acts very well in this case. And apart from this, neurosurgical decompression that you, you, you can think of going for a vision if you suspect that the vision loss might be due to uh, and, uh, high intracranial pressure in case of optochiasmatic arachnoiditis. So transverse myelitis is TB. So traditionally it was taught to us that it is a very TB is a rare cause of transverse myelitis. But in a recent paper and in recent literature, it has been increasingly reported. So uh, it is uh, mostly in TB, it is in CNS, it is longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, which is which we call ADT and neurology. So the, there is the importance is there to have a, an MRI spine when we are suspecting CNS tuberculosis. It presents with uh, quadrivalesis, either it may be paraparesis with paraparesis involvement, the risk factor for developing transverse myelitis in TB is the very severe disease in presentation and high CSF protein. So uh, if you ask me the treatment, treatment for transverse myelitis that, that is not well delineated, delineated in literature, but we prefer to go for pulse steroids to treat transverse myelitis in TB. So my next topic, and that is the lymph node TB. It might be superficial or deep. So, uh, I'm highlighting the important points that uh, uh, in case of lymphadenopathy, when you suspect tuberculosis, apart from the constitutional signs, so uh, TB lymphadenitis, it often uh, goes like in a wet skin and wetting pattern. The patient says, uh, I had some lymph, lymph nodes and then it was painful, but it subsided, but I am still using wet. So this is the uh, exact scenario when you should suspect. TB lymphadenitis. And if examination, if you find mantic lymph nodes or uh, lymph node abscesses or sinuses, then the suspicion is very high for tubercular lymphadenitis. Uh, important point to mention that in case of cervical lymph node, it is more than 1 cm, and in case of inguinal lymph node, it is more than 2 cm to call the lymph nodes uh, significant. So, in diagnosis, apart from routine imaging, CT thorax and abdomen is a uh, very good adjunct, very good. Uh, Test uh, uh, to to find out any lymphadenopathy, and if you are finding necrotic nodes, so the diagnosis of TB is very high in presence of constitutional symptoms. So sampling, so FNAC and biopsy. So we often prefer FNAC, but biopsy should be prefer preferred over FNAC. In many studies, it has been proven that to prove to find out tuberculosis granuloma, 
Biases are very, uh, biopsy is much bigger and it is much sensitive than FNS. So whenever you are go for your targeting a lymph node, either going for uh, uh, an FNS, it firstly uh, distorts the architecture of the lymph node. If you go for uh, further biopsy, so it is uh, it is better to take out the lymph node either surgically or you can get a two cut biopsy done. So in case of deep seated lymph nodes, the imaging guided like USG or CT guided. And in case of uh, peribronchial lymph node, you can go for EBUS. Uh, so, uh, in extra permanent tuberculosis, as it involves different body systems, you can you can see that um, uh, the expert, the reference to the experts, referred to the specialists. At times, you, that is that is a that is a call you have to pay. That you have to refer a patient to pathologist to get a bronchoscopy and EBUS done to get a biopsy from a peribronchial. So these are typical tubercular uh, metastasis in and if you, you are seeing heterogeneous uh, enhancement showing necrotic lymphomas. So uh, it, this is a typical histopathology where you, 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 you can find KZD or non kzd metastasis, you can find positive AAP stain from histopathology and Langhans, Giants, Jesus, necrosis. These are typical findings of lymphomas tuberculosis. And whenever you are sampling a tissue and you are sending it for microbiological tests, it, it, it should be kept in mind that it should be sent in normal saline. So for malignant samples, it will neither grow the bacteria nor it can be a process for a polymerase chain reaction that is PCR. So for gene expert culture and microbiological test, you have to send the tissue in normal saline. So it is a standard treatment for lymph node tuberculosis, two months intensive phase and four months um, continuation phase. But uh, I'm giving a case scenario that 25 years male who present with BDS and lymph node has completed six months of treatment, but there is persistent of lymph, persistence of lymph nodes in your imaging. So what should you do? Or clinically, there is persistence of lymph nodes. So if there is no uh, persistence of symptoms, that the, the, there is resolution of symptoms, and no, need, no interval change in imaging or clinically for four months, so you, you can safely discontinue anything if that person has completed six months of full course. So there is no need to continue anything for longer as the lymph nodes are persisting. In, in, in most of the cases, these are scarred lymph nodes and it be, uh, that is the, the bacteria is not viable inside. This is the second scenario that you have started ADT uh, after microbiologically confirmed cervical lymph node TB. After initial improvement, there is pain and rapid enlargement of nodes after four weeks of ADT. And you are finding this type of condition. So this is IDS, that is immune deconstitutional inflammatory syndrome, or we call it paradoxical syndrome. So when you suspect IDS or paradoxical phenomenon, so there is no need to uh, discontinue anything. So you you do not think that patient is not cured or there is a failure to therapy. If there is initial improvement, so you always suspect it's a paradoxical reaction. You just assure the patient and you give some NSSs for free. If there is an abscess, you, you can aspirate it. So uh, this is a very common phenomenon. There is a paradoxical reaction which occurs three weeks to four months when the patient is on ADT. It can, it can be present if it, it is in all cases of ADT, this paradoxical reaction can happen. So briefly about plural and pericardial TB, that plural plural biopsy samples you can take. So plural fluid ADA. The cutoff here is 40. So it has a high negative likelihood ratio. So in case of negative ADA, that is a cutoff, uh, that is a below 40 level of ADA plural fluid, you can safely uh, rule out. Uh, I, I don't know. I won't say safely. You can rule out uh, plural tuberculosis. It has a very good sensitivity and specificity. And these are the other tests. And in case of pericardial uh, effusion, you always have to pericardial, pericardial, pericarditis. You always have to go for echocardiography to find out if there is any tamper, which needs urgent attention. The treatment is the same. So for pericardial TB, there is a role of steroids. So uh, it prevents the conversion to constrictive pericarditis and uh, prevents cardiac tamper. So surgical options, you can go for surgical pericardiectomy in case of constrictive pericarditis due to TB. So in gastrointestinal TB, it is peritoneal TB, industry and TB, hepatobiliary TB, pancreatic TB, there is a long list of things. But the important thing is, when you, whenever you are suspecting 
in CDI, if it is tubercular peritonitis, so most of the cases it is easier to diagnose. But if it is in this genetic patients roam around for months or for years with constitutional symptoms and, and many things, and if you are not finding anything in colonoscopy, in, in, in CT enterography, so there should be a high, high threshold of uh, suspicion for uh, this intestinal tuberculosis. And you can also go for therapeutic trials of ABT in case of GID. So CECT by CT enterography is very sensitive to detect ideological involvement. Apart from this colonoscopy and biopsy and laparoscopy, and even you have to go for laparoscopy to take some biopsies in case of tubercular, tubercular GID. So in case of ADA, the cutoff is uh, 39 in peritoneal fluid, that is the SIT fluid. So it has a high positive likelihood of likelihood ratio. It is more than 39, so you can say it might be GID. So I am coming to urinary tuberculosis, that uh, mainly urinary TB, male genital TB, and female genital TB. The thing is that in case of urinary genital TB, you have to you have to be very watchful that patient that is not progressing to hydronephrosis. It's a normal size kidney in urogenital TB, which, which can lead to hydronephrosis. So whenever you are suspecting hydronephrosis in urogenital TB, you have to refer the patient to a urologist for interventions. In male and female genital TB, it can progress. Uh, fertility and sexual dysfunction. So uh, the diagnosis it is mainly imaging and biopsy and in case of urogenital TB, CECT with CT urography. This is this should be the standard approach for uh, to diagnose urogenital tuberculosis. So the treatment is the same here and the last one is the skeletal TB. So whenever there is prolonged back pain, local tenderness, constitutional symptoms. You should go for a good imaging, contrast imaging, contrast enhanced imaging apart from the synovial fluid and bone or tissue biopsies. So uh, I have come to the end of this presentation. I'm just, I just want to show the, why it is very difficult to identify EPTB even by the molecular methods. So uh, the fluids, body fluids, peritoneal, pericardial, uh, pleural fluids, so the sensitivity of gene expert is very low. But whenever you are going to tissues, like uh, synovial fluid, wound and joint, uh, so it is very high. So whenever there is localized pass, you can take out a bone, a piece of bone, a, a lymph node uh, TB. So you should target a, uh, target for that biopsy and to go for a gene expert, which can give you a diagnosis. So this is the last scenario, that's it. That was the same thing that uh, there is a paradoxical reaction and we have to be more careful in case of HIV. We often time misses uh, the cervical lymph nodes when patient comes with us with HIV, we start uh, straight away for antiretroviral therapy. So this iris happens very badly in case of uh, HIV positive patients. So it can be missed by the routine investigation, cervical lymph nodes, but it can only be detected by neurochemical examination. So that is the uh, theme to this conference that uh, we have to be back to our basics. So we should not miss any lymph node, any structure, if we want to be very watchful for EPT. So this is the uh, take home messages for this um, presentation. And thank you all. Thank you all for your kind attention.